The settlement of Jamestown along the Chesapeake Bay in modern-day Virginia represents the first permanent English settlement on the continent of North America. The experiences of those at Jamestown present the hardships and difficulty involved in establishing a safe and sustainable colony in this new world. English exploration operated differently than that of Spain and France. Focusing with an emphasis on economic success, English settlement and colonization was privatized. Royally chartered joint stock companies were the English arm for colonization. Privately owned companies like the East Indies Trading Company and the Virginia Company of London received royal charters from the English crown. This charter allowed the companies to sail under the authority of the crown, and more importantly, claim and settle land in the name of Great Britain. These companies were investment-driven, with a very few wealthy individuals coming together to finance the majority of the expedition's supply, personnel, and transportation. The crown would assist financially, but the lion's share of the monetary risk was placed on the investors in the company itself. This allowed the crown to simultaneously sponsor a large volume of settlement expeditions without draining the royal coffers and still retain the royal claim to the settled lands. The Virginia Company of London secured such a charter and departed for the New World in 1607. Upon their arrival later in the year, the colonists selected an island and dubbed it Jamestown after their monarch, James I. Jamestown Island was well selected for its strategic advantages. A long peninsular layout allowed ample opportunity to construct a proper defensive fort. This was the only advantage offered by the selection of the island. Jamestown Island would prove to be a miserable place to attempt to erect a functioning colony. It was surrounded by swamps full of stagnant and brackish waters. Infested with mosquitoes, it would prove to be a breeding ground for illness and disease. It was purely situated to implement any sustainable or effective agricultural efforts. It was also quite small, limiting the space allotted to the original settlement. The surrounding area was the home of the Powhatan Confederacy, a group of native tribes belonging to the Algonquin language family, all loosely aligned under the chief sachem Powhatan. Numbering near 14,000 strong, the Powhatan dwarfed the original contingent of 104 settlers at Jamestown. Early thoughts were that this small group might even be consumed by the Powhatan and made to be metal workers. That would not be the case. The first wave of settlers would endure a truly horrible first year at Jamestown. The first year would see a full two-thirds of the original 104 settlers perish. The first wave had arrived much too late in the year to build proper housing and food stores to survive the winter. By the time the next English supply vessel showed up in 1608, the colony was barely hanging on. <clears throat> Enter John Smith. An experienced British explorer and soldier, John Smith would pull the colony back from the brink. He instituted a new policy that if you did not work or contribute to the colony, then you did not eat. Simple. With the second supply came demands from the Virginia Company for profit, resources, and more. Smith responds by demanding that effective craftsmen and workers be sent to first create a sustainable settlement, and that only after that was insured could profits be made. Under Smith's leadership, the colony flourished compared to the first year. Smith mapped much of the Chesapeake Bay and dubbed the new land New England. Unfortunately for everyone, Smith was wounded in a gunpowder accident and returned to England within a year. Following the departure of Smith, Powhatan and his people ended their peaceful negotiations and began to starve out the colony in an attempt to break their will and force them to leave. This will be the low point for Jamestown, and is known as the Starving Time. While awaiting the third supply, the colony falls into disarray. They cannot hunt due to their island location, which also limits agriculture. Much of their food supply had been augmented by native contributions under the leadership of Smith. Without the native food supplement, the colony could not feed itself. The natives became hostile and hunted any colonists that ventured far from the island. Evidence of cannibalism exists as only 60 of the nearly 500 colonists would survive the starving time. Jamestown would be saved when the third supply finally arrived after being shipwrecked in the Caribbean for a number of crucial months. The first Anglo-Native War takes place shortly after the colony attempts to wrestle more and more land from the Powhatan. The first Anglo-Powhatan War lasted four years and was ended when Pocahontas was married to the colonist John Rolfe. The end of this war and the rise of Rolfe deprived
prominence within the colony signified a crucial turnaround in the colony's fate. Rolf would finally provide the saving grace for the colony, as well as its cash commodity to placate those anti-investors in London, tobacco. The cultivation of tobacco along the Chesapeake would turn into a serious cash crop. It would also worsen relations with the natives, as the more tobacco being planted meant more land was needed every year. Tobacco would prove to be the defining characteristic of the colony and early colonial Virginia. Massive amounts of land would be shifted into cultivation of the crop. The natives would not be able to keep up with the suddenly swelling colonial population that was arriving to farm the profitable crop. Jamestown would fight two further wars with the Powhatan Confederacy over the coming decades, but the colony being fueled by tobacco, money, and rapidly increasing population stood as an immovable object in the face of native hostilities. The final Powhatan War would claim the life of Chief Sachem Powhatan himself, though thoroughly dissolving any further obstacle to English advancement in the area. Jamestown would serve as an example to further colonies in the area. The focus on one cash crop would become a norm, creating a band of highly profitable colonies along the Chesapeake.